Okay, great. We have 80 minutes for the next session before lunch, and the session title is The Economics of Batteries and Electrified Vehicle Demand. I want to welcome everyone back after that really exciting first session that we had, uh, good content, excellent discussion, and it left us with a lot of items on our uh, to-do list in terms of uh, analysis. I'd like to kick this session off with just a few remarks uh, in terms of some perspectives on electrified vehicle demand and, and the policy backdrop, which I think we've been uh, alluding to, discussing, and recognizing a whole host of uh, uncertainties in the environment. And part of that, you know, from a business economic standpoint is that we are uh, in disequilibrium. Our markets that we're talking about are uh, in disequilibrium, and we do have a lot of uh, negative externalities that really haven't been addressed by policy. Uh, wish that we could follow up on an a, a bipartisan act that was passed not too long ago called the Evidence-Based Policymaking Commission Act, and the commissioners uh, established in 18 months a report that uh, really offered up a very attractive template, especially as an economist, uh, to develop a a better way to design policy by using a very solid evidence and a database. So we're really pleased that at this conference we have been trying to follow that uh, theme of bringing to you good research, good data, and good analysis. Great. Let me just mention a couple key points that I want to make to tee off this session. Uh, the fundamentals have improved for electrified vehicles and batteries. Retail price parity, uh, I think, is quite possible in the next five or so years. We had the fortunate uh, uh, advantage a couple of days ago of having the head commercialization advisor visit us from ARPA-E at DOE. And uh, she gave a public talk at the university and indicated that the economics in terms of unit cost for the lithium ion battery had improved beyond what perhaps we're seeing in some public documents today, and it did offer up some more confidence around that uh, cost down curve for not just lithium ion batteries, but her discussion of the next gen and how that tech innovation can potentially uh, shift that unit cost curve lower. Uh, cobalt supply uh, could be constrained, and I mentioned here that tech innovation could bail out that cost problem. And in fact, the ARPA-E official talked about the advances in chemistries that are likely to put the cobalt on diet in the battery for an electrified uh, vehicle. And that, that's really interesting. You know, uh, there are so many examples in history when in the auto industry a precious metal becomes very expensive, and all of a sudden, the great talent of the engineering community finds a way out of the problem in terms of innovating and economizing. And we saw that in the case of uh, palladium for catalytic converters. There are other examples like that. And I do think that, that those, some of those same principles apply here. The global transition to EVs has put the mobility sector on a path to make a, a contribution to CO2 emissions growth slow down. Uh, but that, you know, as we learned uh, in prior sessions during this conference, you know, that we're still uh, moving toward that. We aren't there, but we are moving, we're moving toward that. If you said that today is, 
you know, we just heard in terms of the Midwest region because of our coal mix, you know, it's a very different outcome. But over time, as the unit cost of renewables has come down, that we're likely to point toward that CO2 emissions growth uh, slowdown. Now, if uh, you have seen the latest uh, global EV outlook by IEA, you will note it was released in May, and uh, you'll note that they have added a more aggressive policy and regulation scenario called IEA EV30 at 30. And uh, that's an interesting scenario to read about, I think, uh, as compared to their baseline, you can see here the baseline has 125 million EV units in operation by 2030, um, and that's nearly 46 percent fewer than the more aggressive 30 at 30 scenario. Issue to issue, IEA did upgrade its, that is, raise up the um, EV. Uh, units uh, from their uh, 2017 report. Now, if overall, you can see my um, third tick point there, if overall global vehicle sales grow at about a 2% uh, rate, then ICE vehicle sales uh, could peak. We could see some peaking in the early uh, 2020s, and I know many of you will say that's pretty optimistic. That's probably not going to happen. And we do have a lot of questions to raise here. You know, can, can the supply base deliver that outside of China? Um, will China lead at home and abroad? Will we see uh, export thrust from uh, China? And will EVs be produced in Europe and the U.S. and exported to China? That is a, uh, a very open question at this juncture. I will tell you that we have seen strong growth in EV sales just in the recent period. This chart shows first half 2017 for EVs defined as plug-ins plus battery electric vehicles as compared to the first half of 2018. And global sales are up about 66% in that half to half period. Note the very strong rise in China, full year estimate for China EV sales is about 1 million units. You may be aware their target is about 3 to 4 percent of their total output next year. And just coming back from China and meeting with a lot of these uh, EV experts, uh, I heard a consensus that the 3 to 4 percent is on track. Um, you might be aware that they are really trying to address the segment demand for crossovers and SUVs. Many of the EV company startups are uh, launching uh, a crossover product, not necessarily a sedan. So they are trying to address the, the market tastes and preferences. Uh, China also has a target of 5 million units of EV sales by 2020. Oops. Okay. And, um, you know, if you look at uh, an EV scenario that we have penciled in at this point, and this is really a function of a set of qualitative factors as well as a, a, a beginning to be studied assumption regarding the elasticity. Um, at 2018 estimate of 1.86 million uh, EV sales globally, again, this is plug-ins uh, plus uh, battery electric uh, vehicles, uh, with an average annual growth in the next 12 years of about 40% uh, per year. So this incorporates uh, some of the assumptions around China, uh, not an aggressive growth rate assumption for 
uh, EVs in the U.S., but more uptake in Europe, and then in the other category, which I uh, had on the prior slide in terms of first half, second half, uh, some of those other markets are beginning to adopt at a more rapid rate. Uh, all of that combined uh, could uh, achieve a 20 million unit level by uh, 20, 2025. And, um, you know, a big part of that is this question around the heart and soul of the EV and the extent to which the battery economics will deliver a cost down to achieve that attractive retail price uh, uh, point in, in the marketplace. And that's why I think this panel coming up is going to be really exciting. Uh, major challenges, though. Uh, this slide just shows you on the top right uh, geographic distribution of the uh, assets uh, in terms of the OEMs in China, uh, the bottom left the European layout, the stars, the black stars being OEM plants, the red dots being the supply base. And then, of course, here in North America on the bottom right, again, stars as uh, the plants versus the supply base. There's a tremendous amount of change that would have to take place in order to re uh, configure, let's say, the assets around uh, the, the production of uh, EVs and all of the components and supply that go into uh, EVs. So this is not, aside from all the policy changes and infrastructure changes, this is not uh, something that is uh, for the faint of heart. So I'm just going to uh, recap on a couple of factors regarding policies. We had a great discussion around uh, it, uh, trying to internalize externalities. From, from my standpoint, I really think that the, uh, the marketplace to, to arrive at a point where there is uh, the light, the, an increasing likelihood, I'm going to put it that way, increasing likelihood of retail price parity will change the dynamics. So the market has to be able to start to deliver a cost structure that is, uh, is amenable to attractive pricing at the dealership. And I do think the PAC is a key determinant. ARPA-E says, uh, as I mentioned, that we are getting we are getting darn close to that. In fact, if you want a point of confidence, the DOE recently did take down their target on uh, sell and pack, sell at eighty dollars per kilowatt hour. So there is a degree of confidence that's building around the cost structure of uh, the battery. As you know, the policy stimulus in China has been significant and it's overarching I you know the the uh, discount to the license plate uh, in cities like Shanghai uh, is above ten thousand dollars that value then is has stimulated demand substantially and on the supply side you know they are supporting this incubator of many many companies now, you know, at some point there will be consolidation. The win there will be winners and losers. But you know, it's an interesting thing for China to say. You know, we're really trying to see if we can, if the market in letting, you know, providing a tailwind for some of these startups, but letting the market figure out who's going to be the innovator, who's going to be successful in putting together a good market equation. Uh, for that. So I do, I do think that the supply side stimulus is uh, very, very important as well. 